Good morning, everybody. It is 8.45 a.m. October 10th, 2023. Welcome back to another Market Open. Thank you all for joining me today. We've got a lot to discuss. Uh, this is going to be a very, very interesting Market Open today because you've got Palantir that after a magnificent run yesterday, uh, up about 6.8% at the high, broke $18 in the pre-markets. So we'll check where it is at uh, as we get into the market. I think it's at 1790 right now, 1792 currently in the pre-markets, but it broke 1809 off some news that retail found out before Wall Street. On top of that, you've got the 10-year yield on the Treasury finally getting some momentum on the downside. Yesterday at around 8 p.m., it went from 4.8 to 4.6, right now at 4.7, but a nice decline that we're seeing. You need that yield to go down for equities to go back up. And then on top of that, we have some updates in terms of what's going on geopolitically all around the world. So we've got a lot to discuss. Thank you all for joining me. Let's do something new in the chat today, something we do kind of every month I do this. Um, put your name. Well, you don't have to put your name. You already have your name. But put where you're from. Put where you're watching from. Today, I want to read out not only your names, but I want to read out the country or the state that you are watching from. So make sure you put uh, where you're actually watching from, and I'm going to read those out allowed. I obviously uh, am wearing a hat because I am from New Jersey. New Jersey, uh, I'm from the side that's more closer to New York City. And it's getting cold. I just got back from the gym about 40 minutes ago. And uh, now after I sweat in the gym and I walk outside, uh, it is, it's not freezing, but it's getting to the point where you're just like shivering and you can't wait to get into the car and turn the heat up. So uh, it is getting cold. And uh, I was like, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna rock the dress shirt and the uh, the snow hat and see See how that goes. I kind of like the combination. And we got the, the nice little haircut yesterday. So hopefully it's uh, not the worst combination. All right, here we go. Hi, Amit. This is Anushman from India. Thank you, Anushman, from joining from India. Right now, it is probably 10 p.m., 10.30 p.m. your time, if I got the time calculation right. I have a lot of family in India. I haven't been there since 2019, so I really want to go back. Thank you for joining from India. India, my heart is in India. So uh, Dhanivad for coming from India. That means thank you in Hindi. Tessa Best from Tennessee. Tessa, I didn't know you were from Tennessee. That's awesome. Socrates from Boston. Miami Wren from Miami, Florida. I love it. Paul from Canada. Bay Ray from Texas. Henrik from Denmark. Uh, I will never like Denmark because they beat me and uh, Team USA on a 3-2 decision in the Slovenia International Finals uh, debate tournament. It was a horrible rigged decision, but we lost to Denmark. So nonetheless, I don't like Denmark, but I like you. So thank you for being here. Hi, Amit. Watching from Norway. Axel, thank you for being here. Culling, we got Singapore in the house. Pang Yo. We got Montreal with Missy. We got Nolan from Atlanta. Corbin from Fourth Worth, Texas. Uh, Johnny from Brooklyn, New York. We got New York in the house. We got Khaled from Alabama, Emmanuel OG from Montreal, Quebec, Richard from Miami, Blake from San Diego, J Duff, Denver, Kraft Jan, Germany, Michael, San Antonio, Texas, Phil from the UK, Tata from Houston, Joseph from the Philippines, Robert from Kansas. Uh, what do we got? Nolan from Atlanta. We said that one. That's awesome. David from Germany, jo Jordan from New Zealand, Bucharest, Romania. That's where Michael Jackson played. He had the biggest uh, concert. I think 93,000 people, or I think it was 110,000 people at Bucharest, Romania. That's awesome. We got Nova Scotia, Japan, North Carolina, Mississippi, New York, uh, Denmark, Vietnam, Chernobyl. <laughs> we got people from, from, from everywhere. Greece, Bitcoin man from Antarctica. Okay. I don't know if you're actually in Antarctica, but if you are, that's, that's pretty crazy. All right. Let's get into what's going on in the markets. First thing we got to discuss uh, is Palantir. That is the first topic of the day. Palantir, look, right when I bring it up, we got back to our $18 in the pre-market. So the interesting thing about why Palantir is up right now in the pre-markets um, is really because retail or Wall Street finally figured out something that retail didn't. So this is the press release we got today for why Palantir is up in the uh, in the pre-markets. October 10th, 2023, we got 250 million Dolores, 250 million Dolores from the army to support AI ML contracts in support of JAD C2 capability. So reading uh, quickly from this armed services, intelligence community, special forces, they continue to test, utilize and scale AI and machine learning capabilities. The contract posted the Department of Defense contract uh, or contracting website last week is worth up to 250 million throughout 26. Now, the reason uh, Palantir is up on this today and it wasn't up on this a week ago, it actually declined to about 13.99 is because uh, Wall Street didn't know. Wall Street until they get an update from Bloomberg Terminal because they have nothing else better to do other than stare at Bloomberg Terminal. Um is not going to know about the news that breaks. Retail 
figured this out pretty quickly. I mean, this contract was posted last Wednesday, I think, or, or last Tuesday. And within two seconds, we had tweets in the Pound Trick community all about it. And uh, we knew that Palantir got the contract and it was an official contract, even if it was a press release, obviously, because the DOG reported it. So uh, today, Wall Street finally figured it out because Palantir made it a official uh, a PR. Now, remember, we got the same contract for $43 million back in 2022, September. That was a one-year contract that expired on September 28th, 2023. So the exact same contract, pretty much the exact same language, exact same uh, services, all that stuff was tripled to the point where we went from 43 or sorry doubled 43 million to 83 million a year and now it was three years guaranteed 250 million from 2023 to 2026 quote from the head of Pre uh, president uh pound tier usg uh akash Yane, we're honored to expand our partnership with the army to continue delivering the most innovative technologies and advanced data applications across the armed services maturing new concepts for how we deploy solutions in different contexts is key to maintaining our nation's competitive advantage and we appreciate the opportunity to support this mission and that is why the market is giving a little bit of a pump to Palantir. So this news is uh, a bit old, obviously, because retail figured it out, but it's new to uh, Wall Street, right? And this is this is what a this is why it's so cool to be part of this community because I bought the dip at thirteen ninety nine or thirteen ninety last week uh, or whatever whatever it was two weeks ago because I saw this contract and I was like, this is stupid. You got articles on Substack calling us uh, AI imposters that are being sent out to hundred thousand subscribers. And then, you know, so 100,000 people think that Pounter is an AI imposter, or at least that's the propaganda they're being fed, or media, you could say propaganda, it's a little bit harsh of a term, but nonetheless, probably not the, the most accurate news those people are getting. And then me, I'm looking at the DOD website, seeing them get $250 million for AI and machine learning R&D. Who am I going to believe? Well, I choose to believe the actual contract, and I bought the dip. And so when you're in the retail community, you get to see these things. The opportunity is where the alpha is yet to be discovered. I will say that again. The opportunity is where the alpha is yet to be discovered. And right now, pounds are up almost 3% in the pre-markets, 2.56 up at $18.06, breaking through $18. We're at $18.09 on the high. Uh, after being up 6% yesterday, 1761, because the market finally realized, oh crap, maybe Pounder is not an AI imposter. Now, this could be sold off as we get into the market. I have a couple of reasons why I think we're actually, we might not get sold off and we might actually continue this rally, not just in Pounder, but in all stocks. Uh, and we're going to go through all those macro reasons in, in a little bit, but that is why Pounder is up today. And that's why we're seeing it. Uh, we got Mateo in the chat. Some say imposters, some say messy Usain Bolt. That is that is true. We got Dan Ives calling us the messy of AI. Yesterday, I called Pounder Usain Bolt because of how fast we were running. And then some other people say, look, they're imposters. And so, again, this is why it's cool to be a retail investor. If you find this stuff, if you know this stuff before everybody else, you can make some decisions on your own without having to see Wall Street um, and the without having to see Wall Street momentum justify if you should buy a stock or if you should not buy a stock. So that's what we got in the world of Palantir. One other quick thing I wanted to say, I might do a video on this later, but I kind of wanted to just um, address this really quickly because I think it's important for us to address this before we move on to some macro news. We'll talk about the 10-year declining. We'll talk about oil prices. And we'll talk about JP Morgan that believes that we are going to get a very strong rally, not just into the end of the year when Santa Claus comes, but we're going to get uh, an end of the year. We're going to get a mid-2024 rally when Santa Claus is sitting in the North Pole just chilling because equities will have a lot of momentum to do higher. So we'll get the logic for why they believe that in a second. Here's what I tweeted in the morning when I was in the sauna, okay? I was in the sauna. It was hot. I was sweating. And I was like, you know what? I got a hot take, even though I don't think it's that hot. I'm not going to, well, I'll read just parts of this because it's a little bit long of a tweet. I'll just put it in the chat if anyone wants to check it out. But look, I, I heard from, from the grapevine yesterday that basically Palantir is only going up because there's a war. And basically you're a war mongering, fear mongering investor if you need war in order for uh, the company to do well. Uh, look, I am here to say that I think every investor in Palantir should unequivocally dismiss this statement as quite frankly, just nonsense. It's ridiculous. The idea that you need a war to happen in order for your stock to go up and, and more importantly, you want a war, you want people to die is just ridiculous. And here's the reason. No single investment is either completely moral or completely immoral. So every investment has an opportunity cost, right? If you invest in Tesla, knowing that the rise of Tesla will kill jobs in the coal industry, and those people can't just learn to code, they can't become YouTubers, right? You can't just like say, oh, you should adopt to the modern economy. Like they have a job, they've had a job for 30 years, and now that job is going away because of the rise of green energy and electric vehicles, et cetera. 
it's pretty immoral to invest in Tesla to have those people lose their jobs and not have bread on the table. That's a kind of ridiculous argument, right? And the reason it's ridiculous is because there's an opportunity cost to people, uh, to, to an economy that's developing and getting into a new world and things are going to happen. There's going to be casualties, but that's the nature of technological innovation. That's you know ultimately what happens. The thesis for Palantir from the government side, not the commercial side. And commercial side is a whole different question, right? I think AI throughout the enterprise is a massive market for Palantir, a trillion dollar market. Palantir can capture a certain part of that. The thesis for the government side is that bad things happen and they're ine inevitable. Alex Karp has been talking about this for the past couple of years. Look, bad things happen and we should probably pay attention to the bad things that happen. This guy has access to the highest levels of intelligence globally. So if in January 2022, he's saying, hey, kinetic warfare might start happening and then Russia invades Ukraine a month later, we should probably take him seriously. So to me, as a pounder investor, this doesn't mean you want wars to break out uh, because even from an investment perspective, if you have more geopolitical instability, it's bad for supply chains, inflation, et cetera, which is bad for the entire market. It means that you've accepted the inevitable that certain values like democracy are under attack. And at the end of the day, to have freedom, you need to defend those values. You need to stop bad things from happening. And if Palantir is a software that ends up having a stock price that goes up because the government de or the market deems that, oh, there's going to be more demand for the software because guess what? Bad shit is happening and you kind of need some type of technology if you don't have a nuclear weapon to stop or at least mitigate that bad stuff from happening. Then to me, it's a really good thing, a really ethical thing that that software exists in the first place. And the perceived uh, increase in stock price is simply uh, the basis of the market is saying that there's going to be more demand for that product. It is not you want World War III just for the product to be useful. It's, hey, we should have the product in case World War III happens or better yet, to stop World War III from happening. So I think every investor here really should not feel uh, immoral about investing in Palantir. I think it's a ridiculous argument. And I think it's important to just recognize, like, look, if the stock's going up, it's because you're investing in something that's actually doing good for humanity, not something that's trying to, you know, cause people to die. Okay, so uh, let's move on from there. That is the Palantir discussion. Let's move on to what's going on in the macro, which is influencing why Palantir is rising along with some other stocks. So we've got the tenure that's coming down pretty aggressively. For those that, again, are unfamiliar with it, the 10-year treasury is a 10-year fixed contract you enter in with the United States government. Uh, and as a result of that, you get a fixed return every year by entering into that contract and purchasing those bonds. Right now, we're at 4.694%. We have been waiting to see this thing come down since it was at 4.85. If you round up, it was basically at 4.9 and now coming down to 4.6. This is incredibly, incredibly important uh, to see this come down because essentially as yields find a little bit more of a top, equities can find a little bit more of a bottom. And as yields then make their way down, a lot of that money is transitioning from bonds ult ultimately into the stock market, right? Either fixed market money, market funds, uh, treasuries, bonds, or cash, or stocks. And if we see stocks go up as yields come down, it's coming into stocks. Now, the question is, why after a massive geopolitical event that we saw yesterday with Israel and Hamas, why after still struggles for inflation, by the way, we have CPI expectations we'll talk about in a little bit because we've got CPI tomorrow. So we'll be starting the live stream early at 820 tomorrow. Why after still 10 year being at 4.69, which is not good, right? It's not like it's not as bad as 4.9, but at 4.69, it's still not good. Why are equities starting to find a little bit of a bottom? It might be because honestly, the market thinks we're oversold. And it's that simple. At the end of the day, we had a 10% correction from 460 to 420. We hit the 200 day moving average. Uh, some tech stocks fell pretty aggressively during this 10% decline. We saw valuations get cut a little bit. Amazon, for example, went from 143 down to 126. Yes, FTC lawsuits, all that stuff, external things that happened. We still saw some pretty aggressive decline in equities. Apple, for goodness sakes, went from 197 to 168. At some level, you've got to ask yourself, the 5.5 trillion that's sitting on the sidelines, are they going to come out and play with the big boys? Or are they going to stay in their little money market funds and get 5% that's going to be eaten away by inflation? Like at some level, you're going to have to ask yourself if you want to take a risk. And America is known for taking risks. That's why we have one of the best stock markets in the world. That's why we have all this liquidity because investors take risks on innovative companies. And I believe it's getting to the point where the market's realizing, wait a second, why are we not taking a risk at Amazon at 126? Why are we not buying the S&P 500 at 4,200 with a lot of things pointing towards the downward uh, side when it comes to things like yields on bonds and inflation? If that's the case, then we're going to see some momentum in equities and that might end up leading to an end of year rally. Uh, and that end of year rally might be pretty uh, effective for stocks. Another piece of macro news I want to talk about is CPI expectations. So we will be live at 820 tomorrow. Tomorrow's CPI 
I want to say is going to be really important, but I kind of feel like it's going to be a nothing burger. Um, and the reason I think it's going to feel like a nothing burger is because the last CPI was really important and that ended up being a nothing burger. We inched up towards 3.7. So, you know, not the best. Uh, expectations for a headline are to take down to 3.6. So this is where we see CPI expectations. It would increase um, about 0.3% month over month. Um, and core CPI also 0.3% month over month. Remember, uh, the core is what the government and more specifically the Fed cares about than anything else. And we've seen a nice decline in core last month. Um, CPI year over year, 3.6 versus 3.7. Look, if we tick down you know, 0.1%. I don't know if the Fed is going to really change their mind. Either they're going to raise rates because they think we want to be higher for longer, or they're going to recognize all the stuff that's going across the world, like, you know, terrorist attacks. And maybe they're going to chill on the raising of rates. Maybe they'll realize Bank of America has hundreds of billions of dollars of losses, or at least all the banks in the United States combined. I think Bank of America has like tens of billions of losses on their loan portfolio. And maybe raising is not going to be the best thing in the world for some of these banks. So if the Fed really wants to destroy the economy, then 3.6 versus 3.7 is not going to matter. Uh, obviously, if it, we come in at 3.4, 3.5, that would be phenomenal. The reason why that's likely not going to happen is because gas prices for the far majority of um, September were at uh, 95 bucks. Currently, we're at 87.66, right? So not bad at all. Being at 87.66, uh, we're down from that 95. We are in the past... Uh, five days down 3%. It went up from 84 to 87. We're down a little bit today. So it's good seeing gas come down. But uh, because gas was pretty high in September, we're likely going to see it have a major impact on CPI. I am most curious when it comes to CPI, how much rent inflation is coming down and how much housing inflation, meaning the supply of housing entering into the market might be bringing down overall prices. Because if you go on Zillow, it looks like we're in one of the biggest housing bubbles of all time with some of these housing prices. And the fact that they're actually being sold it's not just like numbers on a screen. Like you list a house for 1 million, even though it's worth 700,000 and you'll get five offers instantly. Like it kind of feels like a bubble. So it's going to be interesting to kind of see where it comes down from there um, and what we see tomorrow. You're an hour ahead of Central. Yeah, so I'll be 820 um, uh, Eastern, 720 Central, 520 Pacific. And then all the people that are international, we had a lot of international people that put their location in the chat from Singapore, Greece, Melbourne, Australia, Japan, I don't know all your time zones. I'm sorry about that. I should I should memorize all the different time zones so I could just spit them out. Uh, but 8.20 a.m. Eastern, we will be live to discuss CPI. And the crazy thing is American CPI affects the entire market, which is just like wild that everyone around the world needs to pay attention to the American market. You know what would suck? Living in the West Coast. I Like living in the West Coast is awesome. But if I had to wake up at uh, 6.20 a.m. No, no. I do the market. I would have to wake up at like 4. 45 a.m. to do the same market open or 545, which means I would just wake up at like 2 a.m. to go to the gym. It just, it, it, I'm, I'm happy I'm on the East Coast. That would, that would just not be the, the best. Two plus two GMT for Sweden and Finland. All right. So we got a lot of countries that are depending on tomorrow's CPI. Um, all right. Let's transition to JP Morgan. JP Morgan has come out and they are saying, look, we expect equities to reach a new high middle of next year which is really interesting. Some of the logic for what we're seeing. Let's have them talk a little bit and let's see if you guys agree or disagree with what they say. Alessandro Refrancinci, I probably butchered that, is from Italy. You have such an Italian name. Alessandro Refrancinci, I'm saying this so wrong, but it sounds Italian. So you are, you are definitely from Italy. All right, here we go. JP Morgan, equities will retire next year. This is not going to be something that's continued. Or Why is the volume so low? Okay, here we go. There you go. Or is it just too hard to figure out? So you put it in the too tough pile. Well, I think it is really tough to anticipate where this is going. But I think history also gives us a pretty clear roadmap on geopolitics and the impact on markets. Typically, you do get a quick knee jerk reaction, but markets quickly tend to pivot back <laughs> towards fundamentals. And so I think that while there'll be an eye on what's going on in the Middle East, particularly if, as Marianne said, there's some contagion in the oil markets, I think the focus is going to shift back to the Fed. It's going to shift to earnings that are coming up this season. And I think that our view is that the earnings outlook looks good. We think we bottomed out last quarter. We begin to reaccelerate. And the fundamental story is a good one, which is supportive of stocks.
So you don't think there's any sort of a hard landing coming that this is this is the economy is going to look OK throughout all of it? I'm sorry. I was muted. I, you, you would think I'd be done with these rookie mistakes. Basically, I said I agree with him. Uh, I think earnings are going to be fine. Google's going to be fine. Amazon's going to be fine. Tesla, the margins are going to suck a little bit. But Q3 earnings, if they're good, then we are going to see an end of the year rally. I'm sorry for these rookie mistakes. I, I got to get better. <laughs> Love this. We, we think we're going to get a soft landing. We think growth next year is going to, to slow. Um, but but not to the point where we see a major recession. And we think that that's going to take the pressure off of inflation, take the pressure off of the Fed, and ultimately be a good thing for equity markets. We think we make new highs by the middle of next year, driven largely by earnings growth, not by valuations, although the sell-off recently has given us a little bit more of a cushion on the valuation side as well. Marianne, you agree with that? I actually do. And I think what we're not talking enough about is if you look at the ISM manufacturing data, it's actually improving. Now, we're not above 50, but it looks like manufacturing has actually bottomed. That's a good point, because if manufacturing is bottomed, then a lot of these supply chain bottlenecks are going to clear up and we're going to have a lot more supply to meet demand, which means we'll stabilize when it comes to inflation. Inventories are low. They're going to have to be rebuilt and prices paid are actually falling. So it, it's really a positive mix now, we think, in manufacturing. We think that's going to help boost earnings. And even when we look at margins, we still think that companies can actually improve their margins. So we do see a better outlook for earnings next year. Again, as long as you know crude oil doesn't spike higher and stay higher, we think the outlook for the market um, remains very robust. And I would agree that we can reach new highs next year in the markets. All right, Stephen, if you think that's the case, where are you telling people to put money? I guess you think that this pullback is an opportunity. Yeah, we've been saying that. We think this pullback is an opportunity. We're so 4,200, they think is an opportunity. They think margins are going to increase and they're advising their clients to put money. The reason I want to show this is because I know like a lot of these big banks flip-flop all the time, right? They say one thing, say another. But these are some of the head guys at JP Morgan investing their clients that have millions and millions of dollars buy equities. This is the time. This is a pullback. Well, uh, this, is a, this is an opportunity. Will they be right? We'll see. But these are what the big guys are deciding to do. Remain focused on the U.S. Um, we like the story within industrials where we think that there's a lot of longer term policy support for the industrial story. We're also talking about uh, taking a look at equal weighted S&P exposure and mid cap names. We know that a lot of the rally this year has been driven by the Magnificent Seven. We think that there is a catch up trade more broadly across the market. So we're moving down the, the capitalization spectrum a little bit. Not all the way down to small cap because higher rates have a bigger impact there. Sure. But we do like the, the mid cap story. So the and that makes a lot of sense for small caps. Higher rates are still bad, right? The cost of capital is still increasing, so it's going to be harder to grow. But for mid caps and large cap tech, I, I mean, his argument doesn't really make it. His argument makes a lot of sense there. The technology story, you think that's been overplayed to this point, just with the Magnificent Seven, what's happened with AI? I, I don't think it's been overplayed. And I think there's certainly a long term story there. But I think that what we're looking for is a little bit of a rotation in terms of market leadership away from the concentrated leadership of the, the mega cap tech story to some of the broader parts of the market. And Marianne, how do you play this? If you're a strategist, what are you telling investors right now? Where Where's the best place? And would you keep any money in cash right now or you would deploy pretty heavily? Well, in terms of cash, it, our clients have just been flooding into cash because they haven't had a return. Yeah, I mean, it, they just want to have that that income. Um, I'm not even sure I could stop them if I recommended not to go to cash, to be quite honest with you, that it's been such a, a strong inflow. But um, to us, it's, technology is the leadership of the market. If you're going to continue to have this secular bull market, you need to continue to have the leadership in tech. And amazingly, tech is still outperforming on a relative basis in this decline. So that tells us technology is going to continue to lead us out of this. I think you so I think that's actually a really interesting point, right? A couple of things. And this is why I like some of these segments on CNBC, because these are real people that actually have, you know, clients that have, you know, high net worth and they could be wrong. A lot of times they are wrong, but then you at least get to analyze what they're saying on the ground. These are, you know, guys like Tom Lee that literally talk to hundreds of clients a week. Their argument is, okay, so you guys are getting a lot of money, uh, a lot of, you know, risk-free returns from cash, 5%, 4.9%, whatever it may be. You can put your money in Robinhood, get 4.9%, right? Which is pretty easy. All I have to do is dump it into Robinhood. They give me some interest. So you're flooding your money market funds or your Robinhood accounts, your SoFi, high deal savings, whatever with cash. But technology has still done well over the past uh, quarter. It's likely bottomed out. Margins are increasing. AI is still a growth factor. 
And at the end of the day, for any market rally to have momentum, remember, without the Magnificent 7, S&P would be trading at 16 times price to earnings, not around 21. Tech is going to have to lead the way. So if you're investing in the market, you're essentially investing in tech right now, right? I mean, you are like, if you're buying the S&P 500, you are buying tech. And if you're buying tech, if you are bullish on tech or bullish on what can be tech over the next uh, few years, then 5% might end up being a pretty crappy return given Google's up 55%, NVIDIA's up 200%, Amazon's up 40%, Microsoft, up, Microsoft is up 35%, Meta is up 70%. You know, yeah, it's, it's not done too bad. And so at the end of the day, I think their argument for why investing in tech makes sense and why equities can go higher, along with the fact that if inflation is coming down and interest rates don't have to go higher, then we're probably going to see a rally quite frankly. Now, anything could happen, right? I think their biggest risk is oil capitulates above $100 a barrel. They mentioned if oil gets above $100 a barrel, Brent decides to, you know, just, uh, you raise the price to 100, then uh at 100 bucks if that stays there for a long time, equities are going to have some downside momentum. But we're stuck in this 87 range, 84 range. If we can get back down to the 81, 82, we might be setting up for a really nice end of year rally. And then the question simply becomes, which stocks go up? Uh, thank you, 640 people, for being here. If you are just joining, the top headline we had today is that Palantir is up in the pre-markets currently. And the reason Palantir is up in the pre-markets is because we got a $250 million contract for three years, $83.3 million Dolores per year for the next three years for AI and machine learning R&D around armed services, intelligence communities, special forces, combat commands, et cetera from the Department of Defense. Now, if you are a retail investor or you are part of the retail community, you would have known about this contract uh, two weeks ago when we found out about the news on X. And I made a video on YouTube. A lot of people made videos about this. Um, but you would have seen the news. And this is where it's so cool to be a retail investor. Pound here right now, let me bring up the chart, is at $18.10, up 2.78% of the pre-market after being up 6.02% yesterday. A lot of people bought the dip when it went to 1390 two weeks ago on the news a day after it went to 1390 when we got the $250 million deal. And it's just incredible to see, you know, this is actually September 26th, so almost 14 days ago. Yeah, so about two weeks. Um, I will say this again. I said this earlier in the stream, but the opportunity is the discovery of stocks where there is, the opportunity is when there is no discovery of the alpha. So Wall Street is figuring out about this $250 million deal today, which is why the stock is up 3% after being up 6%, which means in the past two days, it's up 9%. It might be sold off, might go higher. We'll see what happens at 930. But it's up 9% in two days because of uh, obviously the things that have happened over the weekend and because of this contract recognition. Retail knew about this contract and I knew a lot of people that were buying it at 13, 14 bucks because we were like, what the hell? This is ridiculous. Why is the stock going to 1390 when they just got $250 million? It's not a small amount of money for AI research and development. So a lot of the opportunity is where the alpha has not been discovered. And when the alpha has been discovered, which is when Wall Street tends to be a little bit late to the game, there's not that much alpha left. So very, very important to keep up with what's going on uh, if you are part of the retail community when it comes to Palantir. Because quite frankly, we're better than Wall Street at figuring this shit out. We're, and we're, we're just better. We're just way better. And as a result of that, we get to figure this stuff out uh, a little bit sooner and report on it and hopefully get a little bit of upside from there. Okay, so um, that was the top line news around Palantir uh, up at the $18 in the pre-markets. I want to shift to a couple of other pieces of news before we get the market open in 15 minutes. It's going to be a very interesting market open today with the 10-year down at around 4.69%, aggressively down from 4.9% as it opened in futures last night. And this news is about ChatGPT and Google. ChatGPT and Google. So here's an article that broke today. ChatGPT's mobile app hit a record 4.58 million in revenue last month. Uh, this is, I believe, from iOS app um, uh, sales. But um, it's slowing down. And this is consistent with the fact that we've seen their traffic slow down month over month over the past couple months. It doesn't mean that you know a lot of people are not using ChatGPT, but their traffic is starting to go down. While over the past couple of months, revenue growth was topping at 30%, 31% in July, and 39% in August, that has number has dropped down to 20% growth as of September. Still amazing growth. 15.6 million downloads and 4.6 million in gross revenue across iOS and Android. Okay, so it's across Google and Apple. Um, but obviously slowing down just a little bit. Now, I do play for ChatGPT Plus. Uh, I think 20 bucks a month is a steal for the productivity I get from it. But the reason I wanted to bring this up is because Google seems to be one of those AI companies or, or one of those companies that's truly turning into an AI company. We see Bill Ackman loading up on Google. Uh, we see a lot of funds getting into Google. And we see, quite honestly, Google introducing so many new features around AI. 
that it's kind of hard to ignore. Here's an article that broke yesterday around Google announcing new generative AI search capabilities for doctors. I mean, you talk about the healthcare space and where search could uh, be implemented in. Doctors is a huge thing. Google Cloud on Monday announced new artificial intelligence powered search capabilities that will help clinicians quickly access information from different data sources. So you could imagine there's tons of patient research and drug data and all this stuff sort of in one centralized area that you could create a search engine powered by AI for certain hospitals that obviously Google could play a major role in. It can be challenging for doctors and nurses to find information since it's often stored across multiple systems. The new features will be offered to health and life sciences organizations through Google's Vertex AI search platform. And the company said it will help save healthcare workers valuable time and energy. Obviously, incredibly important uh, for different niches in the AI space. And this is something that can be important for Google. So I think when we see announcements like this, what we're going to see, because Google is so quick to market, which is actually a little bit different from Palantir, right? Palantir is trying to get the customers, build entire operating systems for them, and then keep going from there. Whereas Google, you know, with the distribution Google has, Google is you know one of the biggest companies in the world, almost a $2 trillion market cap. They can get connected with this Vertex platform in hospitals probably within a month, maybe two months max, and they can get this stuff rolling and they can probably get contracts in a couple of months versus in, in, in years. And so as a result of that, you're probably going to see, in my opinion, in Q3 earnings, upside momentum for Google um, in their AI revenue. Last quarter, Google put out $72 billion in revenue, top line revenue, $9,000 a second. We did the math last, uh, last, I think, last August when they reported. And it was pretty amazing. Advertising revenue was still amazing. Uh, obviously, ChatGPT did not take away from any of their search revenue. So what we're seeing here with these two conflicting pieces of news is that ChatGPT, or two correlated pieces of news, ChatGPT growth is slowing down. Still good, but slowing down. And Google's introducing new AI search capabilities for different verticals like healthcare. That, to me, screams ka-ching in Q3 earnings. I don't think Google's going to crap the bed when it comes to Q3 earnings. I think they probably bottomed out around that 128, one, uh, 130 range. Now, obviously, if the macro takes a hit, Google will fall just with the rest of the macro. But I think when it comes to companies that are going to perform in earnings and really show the growth, like hard growth, actual numbers that are affecting their bottom line, I think unequivocally Google will be one of those leaders that's going to be doing a fantastic job. And so pretty bullish for Google going into Q3, but we'll see what ends up going from there. John says, Google kills many projects. What's different this time? The difference is if they secure contracts with hospitals and people are using their AI search, um, doctors, nurses, et cetera, it's not something they're going to kill. I also think, you know, Sundar Pichai has been very steadfast around the philosophy of implementing AI into all these organizations. Remember, Google acquired DeepMind, I think back in 2016, 2017. Um, for I think a couple billion dollars, they've been working with AI for a long time. They had ChatGPT before ChatGPT was ChatGPT. They just didn't want to pull it out because they thought it would jeopardize their search ad business. Um, they realized actually it's not going to hurt the search ad business. It's going to make it even better than we thought. So that was failure on their part to recognize what a go-to-market would look like. But when ChatGPT forced their hand and Satya Nadella said, "They, you know, do, do will Google come to the dance?" They said. Mother effort, we're the whole prom king and queen at this dance. You can sit your ass down. Like, we're going to be fine. And I think the revenues are going to ultimately explode as a result of implementing AI into the um, into the enterprise. Um, okay, so that's what we're seeing with Google. Uh, Faisal says, is this going to affect Pounter and NHS to Google for doctors? Not really. Remember, Pounter is creating entire operating systems for healthcare organizations. Google, what it seems like to me, is kind of an AI search functionality. Could they have overlapping forms of competition? Yes. But what Palantir is doing with healthcare is a little bit different in terms of operating systems and creating an entire ontology for your data uh, versus Google implementing AI search. So could there be some competition? Sure. I don't think the competition is necessarily uh, something where you know there has to be a winner or loser in that case. Um, earnings start this week. Yes, earnings do start this week. And in fact, let's get to earnings for another company that we haven't talked about uh, today, which is Pepsi. So the big earnings start in the next two weeks, but uh, we did get Pepsi earnings today. Pepsi actually did well. Let me uh, pull up their stock. I actually didn't get to see the momentum on the stock, but let's pull up their earnings. EPS was a beat and revenue was a decent beat as well. First, let's pull up these numbers and then we'll get into the actual um, earnings. Oh, TFC is up 5%. Holy crap, Matt. TFC is up 5%. I didn't know that. Why is TFC up 5%? Wow. 28.90. Not bad. I don't know, Matt. I don't know why it's up 5%. If you follow the market open, you know, I have a, I have a big position in TFC. I'm very bullish on the company. All right. After Pepsi, we'll, we'll investigate. Maybe they put a 5% in the pre-markets for a bank is, is not easy. So that's, that's interesting. We'll see. Um, okay. So Pepsi beats Wall Street estimates, raising earnings outlook. 
Um, so, oh, they rose 2% in pre-market trading. Okay. So shares are up 2%. Earnings per share, 225 adjusted versus 215. So they beat by 10 cents. Not bad. Revenue, 23.45 billion versus 23.39 billion. I believe Pepsi has a three or three and a half percent dividend. Um, I might be wrong on that. I might be mistaking it for Coke, but I do believe they have a dividend. Pepsi now expects constant currency earnings per share growth of 13% up from its prior focus of 12%. So they increased their earnings guidance. Third consecutive quarter that it's snacking and beverage line has hiked its full year forecast. So more people are drinking soda and eating chips, which is what Pepsi specializes in. Uh, Pepsi reported third quarter net income attributable to the company of three dollars uh, and nine or billion bucks, or two twenty four a share, up from two point seven billion. A pretty nice beat. Net sales rose six point seven percent to twenty three point four five billion. Company's organic revenue, which excludes acquisitions, climbed eight point eight percent in the quarter. This is uh, not bad. It's a consumer staple. It is good for the consumer. We, people are buying, you know, drinks. People are not poor enough. The economy is not bad enough where you can't buy a Pepsi. You know, so uh, not bad at all for Pepsi. And obviously we're seeing some of the upside momentum in terms of the uh, the the market. Um, okay, let's get into some other stuff here. So that was the Pepsi. That's the only major earnings we have this week. I think there were a couple other stocks that aren't that big, but in, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to get some deeper earnings updates. Market opens in nine minutes. All right, let's see what's going on with TFC. So let me just Google it real quick and let's see if we get any news. TFC stock. Let's see, 5% up in the morning. Oh, wow. This, ah, we got the news. We got the news. I, I, I kind of thought this was going to happen. I thought this was going to happen. There you go. Truist in talks to sell the insurance business for $10 billion. I think a couple of weeks ago, I said on this live stream, which it wasn't that hard of a prediction to make if you're a Truist investor, that before earnings, which earnings is in nine days, they're going to sell some of their insurance business because probably deposits are dropping. Cost of deposits is increasing. You're going to show a pretty shitty earnings if you don't have some external form of generating ROI for your company for earnings per share. And it looks like they're selling some of the insurance business. Now, are they selling the entire thing or are they so they sold 20% of it last time. So Truce is in talks to sell its unit to a private equity firm, Stern Point, for about $10 billion. They offloaded about $5 billion of their student loan portfolio last quarter as well. Stone Point earlier this year bought 20% of the business that is now negotiating to acquire the, oh, 80%. 80% of the business for $10 billion. Not bad at all, man. That's 10 billion bucks coming into the company. And look, this is why I am bullish on Truist because regional banks are suffering. Um, I would not quite frankly recommend anyone to invest in the regional banks if you have to ask me because it's a very dicey situation with interest rates. If they come down, the regionals will be fine and all banks will be fine. If interest rates don't come down, inflation ticks up, regionals are going to have a very hard time over the next two years. Truist is a not just regional, it's a super regional. Seventh largest bank in the United States, um, uh, 600 or 450 billion or something in deposits, 600 billion deposits, and 55% of their depositors are small businesses. So the idea that there would be a run on the bank, like where are those mom and pops shops going to go? They're not going to go to JP Morgan and they're definitely not going to go to SoFi. So the idea that there would be a bank run kind of didn't make sense. Tru uh, uh, Truist is trading at COVID levels. And then on top of that, they have an insurance business they can sell. And if you can offload some of that insurance business, you can weather the storm until j decides to lower rates and kind of maintain some of that upwards momentum. So not bad at all. Not bad at all for Truist. Awesome, awesome stuff for Truist. Uh, and we'll see how the market reacts to it a little bit later as we as we get into it. Okay, so Truist now $29, up 5.7% in the pre-market. Not bad. Let's see some other stocks in the pre-market. Google, down a little bit, 139.30. Palantir, $18.07 in the pre-market. Again, if you're just joining, we got a $250 million contract. We knew about this a week ago, but Wall Street figured it out today because Palantir put it out in the press release. So the Bloomberg terminal, that thing they paid $27,000 a year for, uh, that thing finally reported the news. They could have been following you know, the Palantir community on Twitter and got the news, but nonetheless, um, they, their Bloomberg terminals told them to buy the stock and that's when they bought the stock. But retail investors bought this stock before them. So uh, we we knew that news was coming and we we got some of the alpha because of that. S&P 500, 432.68. S&P just performing phenomenally. It was at 422 last week, 426 on the news of the Hamas attack, uh, now rebounding, rebounding to 43 on a declining 10-year yield. So it's going to be really interesting in five minutes what the market decides to do and where it goes from there in regards to... Um, if we maintain momentum or if we have a little bit downside uh, pressure.
5807 on PayPal. Let's go to SoFi. SoFi also is doing really good in the pre-markets. Yeah, look at that. SoFi 825. Breaking through that $8 barrier. We were stuck at 7, which really sucked for SoFi, even 730. I did indeed buy the dip. I think I bought 50 shares in my Roth IRA at 740. And I bought 15 call debit spreads at 85 cents uh, a contract. Now those contracts are worth about a dollar. Um, so I, I think I I decently bought the dip on SoFi over the past couple of weeks at seven bucks. Decently is relative to my portfolio size. Um, let me know in the chat if you bought SoFi. PayPal is officially, I did the math last night, a $10,000 position in my portfolio. So that may be uh, pennies for some of you. It's a lot for me, but $10,000 officially a combination of leaps and shares of in, within my Roth IRA is in PayPal. Let's get PayPal up, man. They got another $2 billion to do in buybacks. Transaction margins have to go up. The Apple Pay collaboration was good. Class action lawsuit is nonsense. Alex, Chris, let's give him a couple quarters. Let's see what he can do. In general, if the market tends to do well over the next couple months, I think fintech is going to rally with the market. I don't think there's a reason fintech should necessarily stay out of the rally. Um, even if it's not you know, as gigantic as tech or AI, fintech should do well. And if that's the case, then hopefully PayPal should have some momentum on it. And we'll see a little bit of upside on, on PayPal. Rivian is up this morning. Uh, Tessa says, I was buying SoFi again in the sevens. Um, VIX oil and 10-year-old down after this weekend makes sense, I guess. Yeah, the other thing is a quick little update, four minutes into the market open. The attacks in uh, Israel, they are escalating in terms of uh, Israel's counteroffensive, but there has been some... Um, some 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 stabilization. So let me share this headline real quick uh, just before we get into the market open. We can see here, um, where is this website? Why is this not loading? Okay, here we go. Uh, Israel has secured its border towns and, and is now targeting Hamas terror hubs. So Israel over the past couple of days have, has been given warnings on the Gaza Strip all over where Hamas territory is to basically say, look, get out of there, we're coming. And they have now secured their border it is unlikely that more Hamas terrorists are going to be able to breach that border. And now they're creating a ground offensive. Now, here's where it can get a little shaky. The ground offensive will likely cause a bit of volatility because they, they recruited 300,000 300, troops to come on the ground. Hamas has its headquarters beneath hospitals, beneath shelters, beneath schools. They use civilians as a shield. And essentially, for Israel to do any targeting, civilians are going to have to die. There's going to be a lot of casualties. So it's going to be kind of sticky over the next couple of days to see what Israel's response is, because Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, has unequivocally said there will be a pretty aggressive response. The question becomes, how bad is it going to be and how contained is it going to be in regards to how the markets think about oil, supply chain bottlenecks, inflation, et cetera. So far, the market is saying that the worst has happened and we can move on from this in regards to the impact on the market. Obviously, the worst has not happened in terms of the impact on the ground. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see kind of how the market maintains momentum. But that's also why we're seeing some rally because if the markets think that, you know, nothing that dramatic is going to happen, then uh, we will have a little bit more momentum on the on the upside. Truest stock. $29.31, up 6.87% on the day. Not bad. Obviously, you guys know I got a, got a big position in this one. I've been buying the dip. I've been, uh, I've been buying. I, mean, I think I put in about $800, which for me is a lot of money over the past two weeks in Truist as I've been, uh, you know, it's, 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 been, it's been rough. So uh, this is some much needed momentum. Let's see what happens when the market opens and how the market decides to treat some of the screen. Palantir up 2.67% in the pre-markets, 18.08. We have 30 seconds until the market opens and it's time to see on a day when the 10-year is down, oil seems to be normalizing, macro seems to be normalizing, inflation is going to come down tomorrow with top-line CPI. Maybe equities have found their bottom and have capitulated and we start the Santa Claus rally. Maybe today is the day that it happens. Sunrise! Good morning, everyone from Southern California. I love that your name is Sunrise and you're saying good morning from Southern California as the sun is rising. All right, everybody. Thank you all for being here. We got 748 people. I am grateful from the bottom of my heart that you are here joining me on the market open. It is 9.30 a.m. October 10th. The stock market is now open. Wake your ass up. Here we go. The stock market is now open. We have, let's start off with good old 
Palantir up at $17.86. All right, so a little bit of decline from that $18 upside we saw in the pre-markets up 1.53% from yesterday. We'll see where it goes in a couple of minutes, but a nice green candle. Palantir up 1.56% as we open up the market. SoFi, $8.28 up 1.21%. Not bad at all for SoFi. Truist stock, $7 and, uh, or sorry, $29.60. It is up 7.9% on the day. Not bad at all. For Truist, we are seeing some momentum there. Uh, the headlines on Truist is they sold their insurance business for $10 billion, which is why we're seeing some momentum on Truist. XLF, the financial ETF for all the big banks, up 0.35% on uh, $33.20, up 0.41%. Arm, $54.56. Rocket Labs, $4.61 today. We're seeing a little bit of momentum on Rocket Labs, up 0.88%. American Airlines, up 1.39%. And United, up 1.63%. Uh, the airlines took a bit of a nosedive yesterday, down 5%. So airlines did not do good yesterday after the geopolitical uh, problems with Hamas and Israel broke out. Them, they are recovering a little bit. Pound here at 1780 bucks, up 1.18%. Google down a little bit, 139.40, down 0.05%. Raytheon and Lockheed Martin continuing their gains. Lockheed now up 1.29% and Raytheon up 0.33%. So the, uh, the market's still giving a little bit of a premium to defense contractors. S&P 500 at 432. We are up at 0.15%. NVIDIA, 454. This stock was at 412 last week. And quite frankly, it kind of felt like the the sky was falling when we saw NVIDIA go down to 412 because NVIDIA is synonymous with AI. So if NVIDIA declines, a lot of these AI stocks are going to decline, especially if the market thinks demand for chips are declining. So uh, NVIDIA normalizing at 454, not bad at all. Still down from 515 on the earnings pop. So if you bought on the earnings, you're down a little bit, but uh, 453, not bad at all for NVIDIA. Amazon at 128, relatively flat, starting up. The uh, market open, ARK Innovation, 39.57. DNA, Ginkgo Biorex, $1.74. I think ARK bought like 100,000 shares yesterday of this one. Rivian, after doing a $1.5 billion convertible note last week, is uh, and it was down 26%, is recovering a little bit. Rivian now at $19.22 up 2.3%. NASDAQ, 13,500. Not bad, up 17 points. It was at 13,100 last week. So we're seeing a nice little recovery on the NASDAQ. Tesla, basically flat, 259. Automotive margins, I think, are what the market is scared about. They have earnings in eight days. We'll be covering that live on the channel. So Tesla earnings will be very interesting. The market has taken the bad news. The market has taken the price cuts. The market has taken the delivery forecast misses and still given momentum to Tesla stock. So maybe the market's at the point where they can digest the bad news and just buy the stock because they believe in the growth story. They believe in the uh, Adam Jonas brother band thesis that it can reach $550 with Dojo and all that stuff. Maybe it does happen and maybe the market's ready to look past that. Or Maybe it's taken uh, a beating on earnings. We're going to find out in eight days. Ford, $12.13. There is a little bit of momentum on the auto worker strike. We'll probably do a segment on that in a little bit. Um, they're coming to negotiations. Nothing final. Nothing definitely not as final as Netflix and Disney and the Actors Union. Uh, but we're probably going to see some type of deal. I would say within the next month, it's probably going to happen. Uh, hopefully before the next potential government shutdown. Microsoft at 3.30, Verizon at 31, Bank of America 26.78, Bank of America recovering a little bit from its 52-week low, Snowflake 163, Enphase at 120, not bad. Enphase was at 112 last week, so recovering a bit there. And Novix $10.33, Google 138.75, Snapchat 869, Elf Beauty $100, Dutch Bros 24.77, Disney Look at that. Disney was at 79 a couple of days ago. Disney right now at 84, 88. Uh, an activist investor is uh, taking a bit of a, a bigger stake in Disney. That may be the reason for why the market's seeing a little bit more excitement for why Disney could potentially go up. Truist Financial up 5.2%. SoFi at 825. And let's go to Pound Tier 1776. All right. So Pound Tier normalizing a bit from yesterday. Obviously, the pre market got to the highs of $18.10, has been sold off. Now it's 1770 up. 0.48%. Look, if you're a Pounder shareholder, you can't complain. 18 bucks was awesome the pre-markets, but still $17.70 is not bad at all for Pounder coming off of that $15 range that Pounder was stuck at uh, for a while. So not bad at all for Pounder showing some uh, momentum at $17.76. Overall, we got a green market. We got a green market, folks. We definitely got a green market. And uh, the market's deciding to give some of these stocks a little bit more momentum. Is Enphase a buy? I think if you are in the long term for Enphase, it's definitely buy. Short term, remember, Enphase thrives when interest rates are low because for people to finance solar, uh, solar needs lower interest rates. So if interest rates do not come down, which I think they will, but if they don't come down, Enphase guidance is not going to be good. Enphase is now at $121. It's a $16 billion market cap. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're doing almost $4 billion a year 
in revenue and they're profitable. So the fundamentals on Enphase look phenomenal. The problem is interest rates dictate solar financing. And if that doesn't come down, then it's uh, it's going to be a little bit harder for Enphase 2 to be a buy. But again, you have to do research on the solar industry. And if you believe in that solar industry, because if you believe in that, Enphase is the easy buy. If you don't believe in that, Enphase uh, is a little bit of a harder buy. So we're seeing Enphase with some momentum. Pepsi is getting momentum. Santa Claus rally is coming early this year. We'll see if Santa Claus rally actually comes a little bit more early this year. It definitely seems like uh, we're finding a little bit of a bottom. Google just hit its 52-week high, not bad, 139. I want to go back to the 10-year and see how it's trading right now and then uh, take a look at how equities are reacting to that. So remember, one of the reasons why we're seeing this upside in equities is this beautiful 10-year has come down to 4.69, 4% down 0.088% on the day. It was at 4.9 last week. So that means money is leaving a bit of the bond market and entering into the equity market. And if you were here uh, in the beginning of the market open, we listened to JP Morgan say that we think we're going to hit new highs on the overall market in 2024, primarily led by tech, primarily led by AI, and AI, the subcategories there being margin expansion and revenue top line growth. They think they've seen a bottom in equities in Q3. They think earnings for, or in Q2, they think earnings in Q3 are going to be amazing. And they think as long as oil can stay below $100 a barrel, you're going to see yields come down. You're going to see money go back into equities. You're going to see a lot of clients that have a crap ton of money in cash decide, you know what, 4.9%, 5.5% is, is fine, but I want to take a little bit of a risk in the American markets because America is all about taking risk. And if I'm going to take some risk, let's buy some equities and we'll see what momentum we can have right there. And uh, then we're going to, we're going to see some, some broader, some broader gains. Uh, sorry, the inverse people are buying bonds. People are buying bonds, which is why the treasury, thank you, Philip, for that buying bonds are being bought up, which is why yields are coming down, which is why uh, we're seeing equities come a little bit more higher. So Again, if those yields can continue coming down, we are going to see equities find a little bit more momentum. And as of today, it seems like equities are following a second day rally, uh, even though we had some harm from the geopolitical events uh, over the weekend and they're finding some more momentum. Right now, what we're seeing is Pounder get a little bit more momentum as well. Again, if you're just joining, Pounder got a $250 million contract that was confirmed today. $18, there we are. We're back at 18. There we are at Pounder, 18 bucks, 17.99, up two point. One nine percent on the day. Uh, look, Pounder is one of those companies. Again, when it runs, it runs. And as Diane says, Pounder does it go to eighteen in a few minutes? When it reaches a momentum kind of um, cycle, it runs. I called them Usain Bolt yesterday because they like to run. On the downside, that's also true, right? So we get it on the upside or downside. But one of the fascinating things about being a Pounder investor is when it runs, it runs. Look at that, Pounder, eighteen dollars and ten cents just hit it for a little bit. Uh, which is what we saw in the pre-markets as well. And this is the fun thing about being a Pounder investor because again, same thing with Tesla, right? When some of these stocks are green, they're really green. Tesla, we saw up 6% last week. Uh, it bolted from 238 to 260 because when it's green, it's green. The money comes in, whether it's FOMO or not, whatever you want to call it, it's green. But when it's down, it's also down, right? And so that is the the definition of kind of being a high growth tech investor and kind of seeing where the uh, upside comes from there. Nick says it's a beautiful day. Um, Pounder back to 18 bucks. <laughs> the American dream to be a successful degenerate gambler. <laughs> I think in general, America is, you know, one of the best countries in the world. We have one of the best stock markets. And at the end of the day, uh, a lot of that money that's sitting in cash, they want to be deployed in the best companies in the world, which are American tech, tech companies. And if they end up coming into some of those tech companies, Pounder at a $30 billion market cap, as Arnie says, volatility, we're going to get a little bit of that money. Remember in 2021 when 18s were considered the dip? Oh, I remember. Because I remember Q3 November 2021, the stock dropped from 25 to 18 or 23 to 18. And I specifically was spending, I remember spending $3,500 that day. I bought the dip and I was so excited. And uh, let's just say from 18 to 6, there's a little bit of volatility. And uh, so <laughs> I remember those days. But now we're back here. And uh, we're, we're back to seeing a little bit more momentum on pound here. Pretty awesome. And we're going to see now if the market continued to go from there. Let's get another bullish view on the market as we see some green. And uh, uh, Fund Strats, Tom Lee's firm, believes that we're seeing a bottom in process. And it's a good time for risk assets. This is not Tom Lee. This is one of the guys that works at his firm. Uh, a disciple of Tom Lee, you could say. Let's see what he has to say. In Israel could play out uh, in the markets for us now with key technical levels to watch. Mark Newton, Fundstrat Global Head of Technical uh, Strategy, and um, with the 
caveat that we are very uncomfortable trying to figure out uh, market reactions to, to things um, like the what happened, the terrorist attacks over the weekend. Mm -hmm. But um, typically, you are able to look back at other incidents and come to some type of conclusion about what market participants can expect. What What is that? In, in Dude, Joe could have said that question in literally five seconds. This is the one thing I hate about this guy. Like, I love him sometimes, but that question did not take. We're in 36 seconds into the video, bro. It could have taken five seconds to ask the question. Goodness gracious. In terms of what you're seeing now, and I guess it depends on what happens from here, and whether the war uh, broadens. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So as horrible as a lot of these events are and potentially could ramp up, uh, you know, my thinking is it is still right to be optimistic. Uh, history has shown us that, you know, during times of military conflict that uh, market volatility historically has been pretty short lived. Uh, it tends to ramp up fear at a time when people are already very pessimistic heading into the notorious bear killer month of October. So, you know, longer term technicals really have not shown all that much deterioration uh, thanks to technology. And if anything, that pessimism combined with you know, seasonal tailwinds heading into Q4 uh, make me pretty optimistic that we're, you know, in a bottoming process and, and you know, it is, should be a good time for risk assets. So it <clears throat> works in, in a lot of different settings. It's the economy, stupid. Bill Clinton said that he was right. right. And it's the economy for what de determines what happens with the market. Right. Uh, unfortunately, it's the Fed that <laughs> right. determines what happens with the economy. Right. So the, the, the real, um, I don't know the, the key point, what, what the, the key leverages of what moves things, probably the Fed still. Well, more yes. inflation and more the reaction to it. It's, it's increasingly becoming consensus that the Fed is likely done or might have Completely. one more hike. Yeah, maybe one so, more. you know, usually when that happens, you see interest rates start to peak and pull back, which likely is going to start to fuel growth in technology. Uh, tech has already been a very good sector. But if you look at the economy, look, it's been... A common, it's a very unusual post-COVID world where you have a combination of the housing market where people are not selling their 3% mortgages to buy one at 8%. And you also have a labor force that's uh, still quite unusual in the supply-demand imbalance. So the combination of those, in my view, uh, will postpone any sort of recession regardless of the you know, 525, 550 basis points of hikes that we've seen over the last 18 months. So, so the, the last couple of points... I will let him finish, but ladies and gentlemen, Pounder is at $18.18, up 3% for the day. Of inflation, are going to, a lot of people think it's going to be much stickier. Than, I mean, we made the prog we made quick progress. It's going to be more difficult from here. And is the Fed bound and determined to get to two? Yeah, my thinking is that the crude oil is certainly something we all ought to be concentrating on, obviously, with the geopolitical Labor conflict. markets, wage gain, labor markets, wage gains, it's all sticky, isn't it? Well, you know, a lot of the inflation has fallen nearly in half over the last 12 months. Certainly it is at a level where it's not at the Fed's goal. But at the same time, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff, in my view, and, and I'm no economist, but it, it ought to figure itself out on its own. Uh, technically speaking, regardless of interest rates having risen, you know, economic data has come in a lot better in, in recent weeks. So... You know, the, the Fed is at a tough spot, but at the same time, we do see other evidence of it. Right. So <clears throat> have we done enough consolidating? All right. So, uh, I mean, his point is pretty much echoing what Tom Lee said in regards to oil needs to remain down. We heard from two analysts today. Oil needs to remain down in order for us to have momentum. So oil below 100 is good for the markets. Yields will come down. And as a result of that, we're going to have a little bit capitulation in stocks. What we're seeing right now in the equity markets, I love saying equity markets versus stocks. I seem so much more official. I seem like a true macro economist. What we're seeing in the equity markets today versus stocks is uh, some upside momentum. So Pouncer hit 1821, immediately got sold off. So people definitely took their profits right there at $18.21. That was enough for the algorithms to take some profits right now at 1803. We'll see. Again, Pouncer is, uh, it runs pretty quick up, up and down. So we will probably see it either come right back up or it might come down. It usually doesn't say too flat and we'll see where Pounder goes from there. But right now, Pounder at 18, uh, 1799, 18 bucks. SoFi doing well at $8.27. We have earnings on October 30th. I think earnings are going to be good. I think, uh, quite honestly, what I think is, I think SoFi can run to 10 on earnings. I think if we beat member growth again, and somehow, I don't think it's going to happen, but somehow we show gap profits, SoFi is going to have a good day.
Um, but I, I, the gap profits thing is going to be hard to imagine. So I, I, I'm not raising my expectations for that. Even member growth, 584,000. I don't know if we beat that, man. That's going to be really tough. Um, as long as we can come in line with numbers and maybe just inch a little higher in certain metrics, Galileo can show some growth. I think hopefully around nine bucks, we can easily gain some momentum there and capitulate there for SoFi. SoFi right now at 828. If you bought the dip at 730, 720, you did well. And if you bought the dip on Palantir at 1314, you did well as well. Truist now up 5.3%. Big news for them today. Sold their insurance business for $10 billion to Stone Group, which is a private equity firm. That's why Truist is getting some momentum here. Probably going to be really good for their Q3 earnings and show momentum. On top of that, they are cutting $750 million worth of costs over the uh, next year or the next like three years. So hopefully investors are pleased with their earnings, even if deposits decrease a little bit, because as soon as the Fed lowers interest rates, SoFi's 11-year low might <laughs> go a little bit higher, right? Maybe we don't have to be at the 11-year low anymore uh, when it comes to truth and they show some momentum. Pounds here now dropping off a little bit to $17.86. Google's down a little bit, $139.28. Um, Tesla... Tesla is up. Tesla, my Esla, 263. Not bad. Tesla's up 1.55%. Not bad at all. Smitty says, Tom Lee makes a ton of sense when he talks. He's a constant reminder that the market is forward looking, staring at you, room and gloom bears. Yeah. And remember, Tom Lee said September is going to suck. I mean, he's been pretty, pretty on point with a lot of his analysis. And I think some people think Tom Lee just spurts out nonsense. If I, I listened to a podcast of him a couple weeks ago, this guy is talking to 100 to 200 people a week in terms of equity markets. He has like thousands of clients. And a lot of his clients, one of the funny things he said in that podcast is that they don't like him because he said in January, buy the dip. He was like, the S&P's at 3,400, buy the fucking, buy the market. And his uh, client said, no. And then it ran to 3,700. He was like, buy it. They were like, no. It ran to 39. He was like, buy it. They said, no. Went to 4,300. He was like, buy it. They said, no. Then it topped at 46. And guess what he said at 46? He was like, yeah, it's probably going to come down now. <laughs> and so it's like, he, he called it so correctly. And it, he was just basically saying he has clients that legitimately do not like him because he's so right. And he has to deal with talking to them every day. So um, it's it's one of those things where he's been pretty accurate this year. And now it's just a question to see kind of where it goes from there. Again, Tesla is up 1.9%. Uh, earnings will be up for Tesla on October 18th TFC up 5.9% of the day. So far breaking $8.30 now, $8.31 up 1.53%. And pound tier is 17.97. Again, it was just at 17.85, just at 18.22, now back at 17.94. Very volatile right now, but we've got a lot of money. Look at the volume 23.29 million shares are trading hands right now. That means there are people that are buying it, there are people that are selling it. People are buying it, people are selling it. People are 23 million times in 18 minutes. It's just insane to constantly remember that like there's that much liquidity and money flowing into, into the stock right now. Um, so we're seeing momentum there. Uh, uh, Austin says, admit I'm here. The person with the key didn't show up to the office till 40 minutes after. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? The person with the key didn't show up. So you get to get paid for just waiting outside the office because uh, it's not, it's not your fault. It's, it's like when the teacher uh, is, is stuck at uh, lunch and doesn't open up the classroom in high school and you're waiting to get into the class and the teacher's not there. You're like, well, I can't, I guess I can't go to class today because the teacher's not there. So uh, instead you stay with the market open. That's a, that's the right way to do it. That's absolutely the right way to do it. Uh, Micro says when the NHS deal is finally published, pounds is going to explode. That's another interesting key factor. The NHS deal um, is really important because the NHS deal isn't even announced officially. Now, granted, I think there might be a world in which it's priced in because we saw Poundtier go up about 3% the day the Bloomberg article came out. Uh, that's when we went from like 1490 to 1560. So it might be priced in, might not, we'll see. But in general, uh, that deal hasn't been announced. And because it's ha it hasn't been announced yet, when it does get announced, we might see even more momentum or it might be a sell the news event. It's, uh, we're ultimately gonna have to see kind of how it plays out from there. But we will definitely see some momentum either to the upside or downside when it comes to uh, that NHS deal. Okay, if you are just joining, the reason Pounder is up today, $250 million contract from the uh, DOD. We knew about it last week. Retail did, which is why we were able to get the alpha before the alpha happened, because we, we saw this coming. Uh, Wall Street today giving it more momentum after a momentous day yesterday, because they finally got the article update in their Bloomberg terminal. And so they were able to see that Pounder actually is a real AI company. And we're getting a little bit of, uh, of, of momentum. 10-year treasuries are down in terms of the yield. Uh, Pepsi earnings were pretty amazing today. I mean, they increased their guidance by about 1% going into next year and already had a 12% uh, 
uh, earnings uh, guidance increased it by 13%. Macro is doing well. Equities might have capitulated, and that's why we're seeing a bit of momentum here. Jesse says, I sold Pounder at seven because of insider sales. Look, I don't blame you for feeling bad that insiders are selling. Therefore, you kind of think it's a reason to sell. I just think the the more I spend time in the equity markets, um, insider selling is like, it's kind of like they sell, right? Like Tim Cook sold $40 million of stock last week and Apple's up like 2%, right? It's like, it's kind of just something that happens. I mean, there are days when you should worry about when insiders are selling and it's an obvious like, if look, if he's selling, we should probably sell. I mean, think of NVIDIA. Pounder now it's MT95. NVIDIA uh, CEO Jensen Huang hasn't bought in three years and sold over $100 million of stock over the past two months. And the stock's still at 450. So, I mean, I think he was selling at 470s, 480s. So yeah, maybe it's down from where he sold. But I mean, the stock, you know, $100 million sale is not nothing to be scoffed at. And the stock is not, you know, at 300 bucks. So I think at the end of the day, insiders are going to have to take their profits. I mean, they've been at the company for 30 years. They're the reason why shareholders have any gains. And it's just something you kind of have to deal with. And I expect pound to shareholders too, or insiders to take their profits as well. It's just a question of when they're taking their profits, right? And you, you kind of got to look at your own due diligence and realize that sometimes they're just selling because they had to make a down payment on a house. It's not because they lost faith in, in the overall company. Uh, pound to right now, it's 1796. If it's an early stage company selling, it is sketchy, 100%. That's another thing you have to factor in as well. Uh, you know, is it a company that's kind of pumping and dumping? Is it a GameStop AMC company selling or it's a more established company like Google or Apple uh, selling a little bit more? Um, Erwin says also have to factor in sales with SBC. That's another big thing. Stock-based compensation. Sometimes you got that stock-based compensation. You got to sell. Look at Palantir running right back like Usain Bolt to $18.07, now 1801. Incredibly volatile today between that 1780, 1810 range. A lot of buying and selling going back and forth for where we see. Alexander Kang says he has 50,853 shares of Palantir. Um, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> 50,000 shares, goodness gracious. That's uh, that's incredible. Well, if Palantir ever gets to that $100, $200 range, you are, uh, you are gonna be set for life. That's pretty amazing. Crossroads says you can take Pounder profits or you can take Alex Carp profit. You know, Crossroads made the joke about uh, uh, Pounder becoming Gap profitable and then they'll officially be a spy company. Get it? Spy, S&P 500 company. And I was like, I wish I had thought of that joke because that joke, I, I just, I if I thought of that joke, I would have been the happiest guy in the world. But I didn't think of that joke. Crossroads did. And I was like, that's just such a good joke. Spy company. Um, so there you go. You're seeing a little bit of momentum right there on Pounder in that 1792 range. Uh, let's move on to a couple of other bits of pieces of news, some headlines I thought were interesting, and then we'll move further. Now, this headline, I don't know if this signals that we're at a top, because it definitely feels like we are so back, if you're familiar with that term. An eyewear company is raising $75 million. Now, look, the last time I saw a glasses company raise this much money was Warby Parker. I think that company went public. I don't know how their stock is doing, but I don't think it's doing well. Um, I am very skeptical when any hardware company that, that has nothing to do with defense tech or you know AI is raising hundreds of millions of dollars. Like that's just the margins on these glasses cannot be that amazing, right? Like I, I just you know I'm very skeptical when I see this stuff. So they raised they raised sixty million and twelve million in 2021. Glasses start at sixty dollars a pair including prescription lens, come with a digital experience. See, that just sounds like BS to me. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm wrong. But whenever you say there's a digital experience, like they're not Google glasses, okay? So when I see stuff like this, I don't like it. Now, they do say the company saw revenue grow 24x between 2020 and 2023. That's amazing revenue growth. However, I still don't like hardware companies direct to consumer raising this much money. It's always, it's always a little a little iffy for me. I don't care if the revenue growth is amazing. E-commerce companies raising that much money. Like these are tech valuations when you're raising 75 million bucks. They say TikTok accounts for 25% of the brand's total sales and millions of revenue. Now that is interesting. One could say there's uh, some China risk there if we ban TikTok. I don't know if that's going to happen. But the fact that TikTok is exploding this company to 25% of your revenue, I mean, whether you like TikTok or not, it's just a phenomenal asset to grow a company's bottom line, especially these e-commerce companies. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. TikTok shop is, is rivaling Shopify in terms of its exposure and how it's helping e-commerce companies. So not bad at all for that company. But again, raising 75 million, it's a little, it's giving Shark Tank product. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, bro. 75 million is a little too much to, uh, 
to tech uh, to to hardware companies. But I could be wrong. You know, maybe investors saw the numbers and they were like, you know what, it's 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 doing well. Palantir back on the uh, the swing set, eighteen dollars and six cents, up two point five percent on the day. It can't maintain eighteen, but it's getting to eighteen. It's coming back down, raising back up to that eighteen dollar range. Google, as Kelly points out in the chat, we had a fifty two week high on Google. Not bad at all. Google uh, Google has now become a ten thousand dollar position for me as well. Let me look at my portfolio. I am up $6,315 today. And that's primarily because TFC is up 5%. So my TFC calls are up 20%. So we're seeing some volatility there. SoFi doing well in the portfolio today. Google doing well. Yeah, it's not bad. Google and PayPal have both become $10,000 positions for me. Nothing to some of you guys, but it's a lot for me. Um, and they are doing well. Pound here, $18.02. S&P 500, look at that. Up 0.3 cents, 0.23 cents, 0.23% at 433 bucks. Amazon is up at 129. Where's Disney? We saw Disney hit 84. Is it at 85 yet? Disney 4 basically at 84, kind of flat right now. Palantir back below 18. And Tesla up 2%, 264. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. There is a lot of momentum happening in the markets. Kelly says it's not rivaling shop. It works with shop. Kelly, I, I think you should do a little bit of research into what's going on to TikTok shop because a lot of people don't know this. What's going on on TikTok shop is they're cutting out the middleman. Yes, they do work with Shopify, just like YouTube works with Shopify. But now you can sell your own products on TikTok. And what they're doing is creating this affiliate structure where anyone on the platform, a regular creator, can become an affiliate and make content for your shop that allows people to buy from TikTok itself. And the numbers I'm seeing on some of these e-commerce stores, because what is the, the downside to Shopify? In my opinion, there's no traffic. You have to use Facebook ads. You have to use TikTok ads, et cetera. That's why I've never liked Shopify. Amazing platform, but they don't supply the traffic. TikTok has 2 billion users. So the traffic is there. Shopify right now up 1.76% of the day. So TikTok providing the traffic to all these e-commerce stores that are that are giving them free traffic and you don't have to pay for marketing, and which is the most expensive cost for e-commerce companies that are drop shipping. Um, there's a lot of momentum. Probably not beating Shopify, but my goodness, the numbers I'm seeing are just absolutely insane. I mean, there was a product that sold like 370,000 journals a couple of days ago. It's like, it's just insane numbers because you know you have this affiliate and the affiliates get income from that, right? So that's why they're incentivized to do some of these TikToks. So TikTok shop is doing pretty well. Pound here now teetering between 17.99 and 18 bucks as well. Um, again, staying in that $18 range for Pound here. All right, here's the clip I wanted to show. We have legendary investor Paul Tudor Jones, who has joined CNBC this morning. Here are his thoughts on what he has to say on what's going on with the markets, uh, geopolitical stuff, all that good stuff. Legendary investor Paul Tudor Jones. Let's give a listen to what he has to say about the markets. We have another important guest at the table this morning. Paul Tudor Jones is here to talk markets, rates, the Fed. And everything happening in the Middle East right now. He's the founder and CIO of Tudor Investments, founder, of course, of the Robin Hood Foundation. And it's great to see you here, especially at a moment where we're all trying to make sense of a lot of senseless uh, things. But let's start with Israel in terms of thinking about the geopolitical implications of this, but also how you think it's going to long term and short term affect markets. Well, I think Israel, obviously, it's a it's a huge tragedy, but you have to put it in a larger geopolitical context, which is we now have possibly three theaters where we're going to have geopolitical challenges. We've got the Middle East and Israel, obviously the Ukraine and Russia, and then at some point down the road, Taiwan and China. So it's a really, I, I would say since, certainly since I was born, it might be the most threatening and challenging geopolitical environment that I've ever seen because you have four nuclear powers, uh, three of whom are led by sociopaths, and that would be China, Russia, and North Korea. Obviously, those leaders have zero accountability, responsibility to anyone but themselves, and they have um, not an ounce of humanity in their bones because they regularly disappear, both their friends and their enemies. And then the fourth, Iran is led by someone who thinks God is talking to them and has avowedly said that they want to remove from this earth 
a nation state with probably the most brilliant people ever assembled within a national boundary. So it's a really challenging environment. Uh, if you think about it too much, I want my lucky color to be invisible, right? It's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very threatening time. So that is also happening at the same time the United States is probably in its weakest fiscal position since certainly World War II with debt to GDP at 122%. So it's a really tough time for, I think, the moral voice of the world, certainly been the leader since World War II. It's, it's, a, it's a really difficult time. Okay, let's break this apart. I want to talk U.S. in just a moment, but on, to, to this existential risk that you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, these nuclear powers, mm -hmm. is there any way as an investor to even think about that beyond just the end? Meaning, do you say to yourself, I need to, dare I say, hedge myself against these risks, or do you say that these risks are just what they are, and so I, I, I have to keep going? I think we It's an interesting question, right? Do you buy defense stocks to hedge? I'm interested to see what he has to say. We become inured to headline risk. If you think about the market's reaction to what happened over the weekend, it was a linear response, right? It was, it was, it was risk off, but it wasn't anything that possibly recognizes just how dangerous this could be. So, uh, and I think that's because we've gotten exhausted with, with headline risk. It doesn't mean that we can't have a nonlinear reaction, the market's down the road if something bad happens. So it doesn't mean that. It means that I think at this point in time, we're just probably incorrectly exhausted by this seeing pretty this. pretty bad, though. Like, what, when you say something bad happens, what would that have to be? Something that happens domestically? Well, I mean, if you think about, again, what happened, where this really gets bad is obviously if... Iran and Israel get in direct conflict. That's when it really gets bad because then you've got um, the ability to have kind of a first world war cascade when everyone gets involved. Obviously, the big question now is, was Hamas a proxy for Iran like Hezbollah is or was it simply uh, an ally? And there's, a, there's big different responses that come from which one of those is ultimately determined by Israel. So, yeah, if from a personal standpoint, would I be investing in risk assets now in stocks until I saw what the resolution was with Israel and Iran? You know Israel's going to respond in some way, shape, or form. The determination right. of whether I, Iran was actually responsible is enormous because, again, it has the possibility to really escalate into something terrible. Now, it's very interesting he he says this, Palantir ripping higher at $18.20. I, I have a couple of thoughts on what he said, and I would love to know what you guys think in the comments. Palantir breaking into a uh, new intraday high at 18 bucks and 24 cents, baby. Okay, so what he said. Um, basically, he said, look, the world is becoming a more scarier place, and, it, and it's harder to invest because you're seeing all these headlines, and these headlines make you kind of scared, right? Uh, and it kind of, it, it determines how you should choose to invest in a lot of these companies and kind of how you should be thinking of uh, allocating capital. The problem is, I think the market is unemotional. And what I mean by that is all of us as human beings, if you, if you I, I would highly recommend everyone, I don't, you know, you don't have to be a fan of the guy, but if you saw Ben Shapiro's podcast yesterday, um, you know, you can disagree with him. I don't agree with him on everything, but yesterday he did a podcast just showcasing, this is the first time I've watched an entire show, uh, some horrific videos of what Hamas is doing in Israel, right? You see that stuff. And as a human being, you just, you, you can't help but cry. You're just like, this is, this is the worst atrocity you could ever imagine happening to you or a family member. I mean, it's just absolutely horrible. And then you look at the market and it's up. And I think it's really important to separate your human emotions from the fact that the market is just the machine that allocates capital where it thinks it can get a return. So if Palantir is going to be a software that's in demand because of what's going on in Israel and Hamas, then the market's going to give it momentum because the market just wants a return. And sometimes it's harder to, to extract the unemotional side of investing from the fact that this is purely business, quite literally, in the context of the market. But that's what it is. 
Interest rates go up. The market says, screw it. We don't want stocks. We're going to sell them off. Interest rates go down. The market, like, you know, it's it, it's something I think it, th that it takes to mature as an investor. Now, what, he, what he's speaking about this long-term trajectory about existential risks to the entire world in terms of World War III, et cetera, I'm just a little bit more optimistic than him. I am definitely pessimistic in the short term that there will be more global conflicts, but I'm more optimistic long term, long term that Western values will win primarily because of companies like Palantir. Um, and as a result of that, you know, that's why I, I remain optimistic that stocks in the long term will do well, because if stocks don't do well, America's not going to do well. And I'd rather bet on America at the end of the day. So, you know, that's kind of my investing logic for how I think of what he's saying. Pang Yo uh, Tian says, can, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong, Pang, uh, can Pounder break 20? Maybe 20 is going to be tough. 20, uh, 20 would put it at a $42 billion market cap. Right now it's at 39.1 billion. Actually, I think it'd be like 44 billion. Uh, maybe we'll see if the momentum continues. It definitely can. We've seen it happen before. Hit a high of 2024 um, in 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 June or no no just, just July. Maybe it was August. It was like late July, early August. So we'll see. Let me show you guys the chart real quick because I was looking at it this morning of Pound here after earnings. And let me bring up one bear case for Pound here that I think is important to discuss as well. And it primarily has to do with um. What happened in earnings, right? So I think this is actually important to discuss. So here's Palantir stock, right? This is, let's go to the six month view. So here we are, August 1st, 1999. I think we hit a high of $20.24, right? Now they had earnings on August 7th. We were $17.99 on August 7th. And I think we got to 1830 uh, after hours. That's when we announced uh, the $1 billion share buyback. We announced really bad revenue growth, right? The earnings wasn't good, but the market rallied. And then from that day on August 7th, we proceeded within uh, 10 days to hit 1415. So we went from 1799 to 1415. And then we got down in September 26 to 1396. So we went from 1799 all the way down to 1396. And we kind of capitulated as you can see from August 17th till Sept October 4th, between 14 and 16, quite frankly. I mean, it's really stuck in that we hit 13 a couple times, but a high 1390s. Now we're back at 1820. So now here's the issue. Here's the kind of the bear case in terms of the stock. Um, if there is too much upside built into the company on the uh, on earnings day and Pounder reports a pretty lackluster earnings, uh, they don't have a share buyback to bail them out. AIP growth, even if they announce a lot of customers, that's that I don't think the market's going to bail them out on that. If they announce 557 million in revenue, which is I think 14, 15% year over year growth, it might be sold off, right? I don't know what announcement they can make that can bake an even more premium than what we're seeing right now at $18.16. And I'm only saying that because we saw exactly this same price. I mean, look at it, Friday, August 4th, 1820, pretty much where we are right now. And we got to decline after earnings because earnings just didn't live up to the hype. So if earnings does not bring in some upside momentum in regards to growth, we will probably, I, I don't want to say probably because I have no idea. And again, Palantir is very volatile, so we could see a ton of upside, but we we could see a sell-off. Does that mean to time the market? It's, I, I don't know, right? You got to make your own decision there. But um, I don't know how much momentum is there. Now, look, the S&P 500 at 434, the S&P 500 was 460 when Palantir was back at 1820. Let me say that again. S&P was at 460 back in August when, when Palantir was at this same price. So the bull case could be if the S&P gets back to 460 and we're at 423 and Palantir is already at 1816, then 18 is not that bad of a price. Then, you know, that's that's on our way to a new all-time high or not all-time, but 52-week high. We're going to find out uh, in the next couple of weeks, but ultimately, you know, that'll be what happens. Um, you know, the market's going to have to decide where it goes from there. So we will see. Bro, admit the strong stocks go sideways during market correction. The weak ones capitulate. Yes, that's true. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Palantir is one of those high growth stocks that's very retail heavy and very volatile. So we don't know if it necessarily goes up or down, but it could be capitulating or it could go sideways as well um, on an earnings that's not as, as good. Let's take a last look at the rest of the markets. S&P 500 at 434, ARK Innovation breaking at 40 bucks, NASDAQ 13,546 up 62 points, not bad at all. General Motors is up 1.3%, Ford is up 1.58%, not bad. Microsoft down just a little bit. Google uh, down just a little bit as well at 138.75. SoFi 843, look at that. SoFi up 3% on the day, not bad at all. 
so far showing some some pretty good momentum. End phase, wow, 124. Not bad at all. End phase up 4.3% on the day. That's just, that's great. I think people got tired of a, a $16 billion company doing $4 billion in revenue, highly profitable. They got upset with it being at 112. End phase doing very nice today. And Tesla at 264 as well. NVIDIA at 454. And TFC 2927, amazing, up 6.7%. They sold their insurance business for $10 billion today, which is why the stock has rallied up 6% on the day. And Palantir 1824, up 3.5% on the day. Not bad at all for pound here. All right. Not bad. Not bad at all for Palantir. Okay. That is it for me on the market open. Thank you all for joining. We have two things. I have one announcement and then, uh, well, let me do the word of the day and then we'll do the announcement. Uh, the announcement, I need your guys' input. So whoever stays for the last five minutes, I really need you guys to give me your input on this and, uh, then we'll end it off from there. So um, here is the word of the day. Berserk is the word. Berserk. Berserk. Berserk generally means marked out of control due to intense anger or excitement. It is often used in the phrase go berserk, which can mean either to become very excited or to become very angry and often violent. I think you guys know what I'm going to say. Palantir stocks going a little berserk. It's becoming very excited and it's doing its thing. It's becoming angry at the market and it's breaking through that $18 range. So we're seeing Palantir go berserk today. That is the word of the day. Make sure you use it somewhere in uh, in your in your vocabulary today. Okay, announcement. Um, so I just want to get your your read on this. I thought it would be really good to ask you guys and, and kind of get a feel for this. So I am thinking of switching up how I post videos on YouTube. And, and here's the question I wanted to ask you guys, and I'm really, really curious what you guys have to say. For the vast majority of the past two years, I've been uploading a video on Palantir, and it's been any subject, and I talk about it for about 15 minutes, right? And I do that maybe two to three times a day. Sometimes if I'm aggressive, four times a day, you know, we're getting 10, 12 videos a week, et cetera. I'm thinking of switching that. And I want to know if you guys think the switch makes sense. I want to upload one 20 to 25 minute video a day that has chapters and timestamps. And it explores three to four topics a day around Palantir. Because obviously there is enough news as, as you can tell. I've, if I'm able to make three videos a day, there's obviously enough views or news coming on Palantir. Uh, to talk about every single day. And I want to be able to timestamp those pieces of news. And I essentially just want to make it a daily show where every day there's one episode. So you don't have to see thousands of thumbnails from me in your feed. You see one thumbnail a day after the market opens. So you'll see two thumbnails a day. And uh, you can choose whether you want to engage in those 20 to 25 minutes of me discussing everything there is to know that day about Palantir, whether it's contract updates, funds that are buying, uh, you know, philosophical analysis, new interviews of CARP. I think if I can just put all of that into like three, five minute segments and have one 15 minute video, I think that one video not only would do better from a views perspective, because you don't have like 17,000 clips flying into your feed that I know some people get annoyed by, um, but you just have one video. So does that make sense? And more importantly, would you watch it? I'm not expecting everyone to watch every day. I get it. You guys are busy. You can't spend that much time with me. I know you know, you guys have girlfriends, even though many people have been commenting that they're spending more time with me than their girlfriends, which is how it should be. Okay. That's like how things need to be. I also had some girls commenting they're spending more time with me than their boyfriends. And look, that's just a constant theme that has been happening throughout my entire life. I can't really stop that. But nonetheless, would you click on that relatively every day? Would you engage in that every day? Would that one 20 minute show, even if it's on in the background with chapters and timestamps of different segments be way better than three videos a day on a different topic. Let me put that as a poll in the chat because I am actually really curious about this. I think it'll make my life easier. And quite fr like yesterday's video, quite frankly, talking as a YouTuber, it got 10,000 views, right? Which is awesome for me. 10,000 views because obviously Palantir broke 17 bucks and I talked about it for 18 minutes. I would like every video every day to get to 10,000 views because 10,000 people have like, it's in their mind, right? Just like the market open. Like, okay, this is what's happening. The market open. I'm going to be with the mitt for the next 45 or 75 minutes. And then I'll go on with my day. I'll get some updates. I'll get some news. I'll probably get some jokes because this guy is just ridiculously funny. And we'll move on from there. I want that same feeling to exist with my pound tier videos versus it be kind of all over the place and have, you know, 17,000 videos a day that are, sometimes you might click, sometimes you might not. So let me know what you guys think. All right, I'm putting this as a poll. So multiple vids a day or just one on Palantir? Multiple Palantir vids a day or just one on Palantir? Multiple and then one. 
Let's see what you guys say. Let's see. And by the way, thank you 580 people for still sticking around. I really appreciate it because I, I really needed input on this. I, I, I think I've kind of made up my mind, but I want to know what you guys think. Uh, so thank you all for, for staying till the end and, and helping me with this. So um, I may not watch every day due to time constraint, but I will definitely watch if, uh, every one of them eventually. Okay. Makes sense. I just listen while I do homework. Okay, good. See, not listening to music, you're listening to stocks. You're, you're, so we got high schoolers getting getting a broader explanation. It's like your pound your daily live streams, but in a video format. That is correct. That's what I was thinking. Smitty says that's the smarter play. Um, Tom Brady says this is good. I'm leaning towards one a day. I'm leaning towards one a day because then I can make one video. I can really make it good. I can have a bunch of segments and I don't have to make 17 videos about different topics. One video has all the updates and then every day, you can either choose to watch or choose not to watch. But if you do click on a video, you're leaving with 20 minutes of like information versus just me talking for 15 minutes about one subject. You know what I mean? That that's what that's what I'm thinking about in the context of this. That's what I think it makes a lot of a lot of sense. Uh, I put my phone on the pillow next to me so I can wake up next to you. This is the most beautiful comment I have received in my entire life. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, ba 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 ba. One solid video. Ba 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 ba. One quality vid over many crossroads says. I think that would be a good idea for the dedicated followers, but likely won't drive as much channel growth. Yeah, I, look, I think I'm sacrificing channel growth for quality because I think eventually quality will lead to channel growth. The way to grow on YouTube is you make a ton of videos every day. That's it. Like. I know people will disagree with it, but if you're in the news niche, why do you think CNBC pumps out 50,000 videos, right? Because more videos means more impressions, more clicks, more views, et cetera. But because the top, the channel is focused on pound here, my, my thinking is like, if you're going to click, you're going to click to get pound news. So why not just one video? And, you know, maybe every day, 10, 20,000 people, if we ever get to that point, can just click on one video. It's like a routine, you know? I think that makes the most sense in my opinion. Okay, so we got 123 votes, 76 people, 76% of you think one video, 24% think multiple. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to try out one video a week or one video a day. Not one video a week. Are we crazy? One video a week. We got a lot to talk about. One video a day. We'll do it for a week. We'll see what you guys think. Maybe it'll start today. Maybe it'll start tomorrow. Um, probably we'll start tomorrow. We'll see. And um, yeah, we'll start. We'll, we'll, we'll do that and we'll see what happens. If it goes well, then we'll keep it going. If it doesn't go well, then uh, then we will change it to multiple. But I, I think I think one will be better. I think it'll create more consistency. I think a lot of people will find more value and we'll go from there. All right, that's it for me. One last look at Pounder. Where are we at? $18.10, not bad. Hovering around the $18 range. Thank you so much for joining. Let's see where the market takes this over the next couple of days. And uh, if we keep seeing some of this upside momentum throughout the equity markets. Thank you guys. I appreciate it so much. I will see you guys a little bit later today on Finance Junkies. Please like, please subscribe. And I'll see you tomorrow on the now official Pounder Daily episode one and on the market open. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.